welcome to my masterclass on premium design. I can see the sun works, so this is perfect. So uh, we're going to spend about uh, two hours and a half, nearly three hours together. It's going to be very dense. We'll make a break later on, okay? Uh, I'll try to be as clear as possible. Uh, right now my voice is okay, so we'll see if it can go all the way through. So freemium design, uh, also called free-to-play, is something which is, as you know, relatively new in the industry. Ten years ago, it was very hard to suspect that it would take so much space into the, the way the industry works. Because freemium, it's not just only a monetization technique. Actually, it has changed everything from the way we market game, from the way we develop, we design them, and so on. So free to play, this is why you know, I'm focusing this masterclass on freemium design, because of the, the way it has changed the way we do uh, our games. Uh, ten years ago, it was uh, common to say that the main purpose of the game designer was to make fun games. Now, the purpose of a game designer is to, is to make fun games and to monetize them. So for people like myself, we, who are game designers, it, it was a major change in the way we were working in the industry. So, um, obviously, you know, let's, in order to have a common vision on uh, what is happening today, let's go, first of all, uh, a brief overview of what's happening in the industry. In particular, you know, I want to stress out how important, uh, I want to stress out the role of freemium design, freemium games in today's industry. So first of all, as you already know, you know, uh, freemium is the dominant model on uh, mobile platforms, no matter which one, Android, iOS, you know, or others, you know, it's clearly, you know, freemium, which is overwhelming dominating. More interesting also is that when we look at uh, MMO or Nano, uh, nearly all of them have switched to freemium design. I'm selecting this example for one specific reason. MMO are among the most expensive games to do, not only to develop, but also to run. And on top of that, some of them are using, are based on ultra popular licenses. I mean, when you've got licenses like Star War or Lord of the Ring, you know, I mean, it's amazing that they could not su uh, succeed with the traditional subscription model. They had to go to freemium, which shows you know, how powerful this business model is. We also know that, and this is fairly new, is that freemium is appearing now even on home consoles, <clears throat> which was home consoles for many, many years resisted the phenomenon. Now it's, it, it's hard for them you know, to pass them. So of course, the main uh, business models on uh, console you know, is not freemium, but clearly you know, there are signs that shows that you know, they're adapting to it. Also, if you notice that some of the most popular games today are freemium based, League of Legends, Fortnite, and so on. So, uh, clearly, you know, freemium now, it's not something which is limited, you know, to a few genres or a few platforms. It is clearly sweeping the industry. And then the last point, you know, the last coffin, the last nail in the coffin, I would say, is that now there are freemium titles for nearly every genre, platforms, and so on. So clearly, freemium is a major phenomenon in the industry. The question is that it's also raising some serious issue that we designers, publishers, producers have to take into account. Now, first of all, as you all know, you know, uh, few people, you know, uh, very few people spend money in uh, free-to-play games, in film design. So it's difficult to get some valid statistics, some valid metrics. You know, I got a few of them. I hope they are uh, as accurate as I think they are. What you can see here is that some games, you know, especially games like uh, World of Tanks, Team Fortress 2, are monetizing, you know, a, a large share of their uh, gamers, about one-third. But look at all those titles, you know. Even titles which are excellent, which are viewed as, as models, you know, you know, like Temple Run or jet, uh, Jetpack Joyride, you know. I mean, they monetize, you know, barely, you know, two, three, five percent maximum of people who are playing the game. This is very, very small. And if I'm putting this thing forward, is that obviously when we design games, we need to take into account this situation. Another issue also which is raised by this growing role of freemium design is that, as we know, the market is absolutely flooded with titles. It is not only related to freemium uh, business models. In general, it's also related you know, to the growing role of mobile platforms. But the result is that today, it's not enough to do a good game. If you want to succeed in the market, your game has to be good, obviously. It has to be, the monetization has to be smartly thought, and on top of that, you know, it, has, it must have some uh, market traction. In other words, the game 
uh, must have features that will attract people's attention right away. This is something which is often under, um, under considered by uh, especially indie studios. Indie studios, young teams, you know, they focus a lot on the game itself and they tend to say, okay, we make the best game possible and when the game is completed, you know, we'll care about marketing communication. This is a big mistake. Uh, so of course, um, I'm talking of marketing here, but something which is very important, and I think it's a case of many of you in this room, if you decide to go to publish your first title, you know, or if you want to work on your first title, think from the day one on how you are going to market the game, how you're going to communicate. In other words, don't focus only on the, on the game mechanism. Of course, gameplay is important, but at the same time, you have to, you have to ask yourself two questions. How will I market the game and how will I monetize it? Another also, another also issue that has been raised by the growing weight of freemium design or free, free to play business models is that what we tend to see is that this um, uh, environment, uh, as I say, uh, reward the best and murders the rest. What I mean by that is that if a game is, if, if, if a game is good, it's good. Uh, if it's creative enough, if it's well done, if it's well polished and so on, we'll talk a bit more about you know, how, you can, how you have to start your game, how you can uh, make the right design choice to get market, uh, market traction. If you do things right, perfect, okay? But it doesn't guarantee that your game will be, uh, you'll generate, generate money with it. That's a problem. What we see today is that some games uh, are, I would say, are eating up most of the revenue generated you know, on, on, uh, on mobile platforms, for instance, uh, and then there's almost nothing for the rest, of the, uh, the rest of the titles. Not because the titles are bad, but just simple because the market tend to, you know, to reward you know, a few best titles, and for the other title, you know, they just don't get only crumbles, as I would say. Another also issue which has been uh, uh, raised recently, it's the growing weight of what we call the whales. You know, the whales are the share of the players who spend most of the money on a game. So it makes sense that for products, for any products, you've got some heavy you know, power consumers, you know, it makes sense. In our industry, especially here, I think it's a problem because what we, what we see is that a um, very, very sh small share of players actually spend most of the money on games. So personally, I find that it's very dangerous. So I Try to, I, I tried to find some statistics on the phenomenon. I find one which I found a bit disturbing. Uh, it was a, a study made by the, uh, the, the, the consulting company Swerve, uh, made in 2016, and they found out that uh, less than 1% of players um, are um, actually generating 48% of their revenue for free-to-play uh, mobile games. Now, this is kind of scary because it means that, okay, you've got those people, you know, they, you know, they spend a lot of money. But at the same time, if they leave, what will happen? You know, that means the whole thing can crumble. So today it's working, but I think there's a real danger here for the industry. And then also something else that should not underestimate it is that some players just don't like free-to-play games. I mean, they like the game, they just don't like the way they are monetized. So this is something which also should be taken into account because as we'll see later on, today obviously I will talk about free to play, I will talk about mobile, but also I want to extend, I want to extend my talk. Because today, if you, are, if you decide to develop a game, to publish it, you, know, you should not necessarily you know, focus on mobile. You should try to see, see the market as a growing, growing uh, body, which is changing, and maybe in a two years you know, you'll be doing on another platform. You just don't know. True, it is true that mobile, it's the major platforms today on the market. Will it be the same in a few years? Well, nobody really knows. F furthermore, if you want also, uh, it's not because you're on the, on the leading platforms in terms of volume that you'll make money with your game. Uh, sometimes it's wiser to go for a niche strategy and focus on a platform which is maybe less popular, you know, in terms of volume, but uh, platforms where you have much more chance of uh, generating money. Some of my clients, for instance, you know, that have been working on mobile are going back to Facebook games. They say mobile is just too difficult. On, of course, you know, Facebook, 
Facebook games, you know, are kind of not as popular as they used to be, but you know, it's still there. You can make money with it. Obviously, the the um, can I say the, the the audience is more it's broad in terms of volume, but it's not as diversified as mobile. You know, on on, on mobile uh, audience, you've got everything. You've got gamers, you've got casual people, you've got all kind of gamers you can have. On Facebook games, it's much more uh, restricted, you know, to casual gamers and only certain kind of casual gamers and so on. So it looks like it's a, not a platform as interesting as mobile. It's not the case. Actually, Facebook has interesting opportunities. So my point, what I'm trying to see, to, to, to explain today is that obviously this talk is focusing on, uh, on freemium design, uh, mostly on mobile. But what I want to ex express to you, what I want to say to you is that keep your minds open, you know. What I'm going to say today can apply to many platforms and actually hopefully I'll give you the tools that you'll be using, you know, to make the right choice, not only in terms of platform, but also in terms of monetization uh, uh, strategy. So what we can see is that clearly freemium is dominating. Now, will, you know, take over the world? In other words, will everything turn freemium uh, in a few years? No, probably not. Uh, first of all, as, uh, as you know, uh, freemium is not necessarily adapted to all games. Some games are not, do not support easily freemium designs, either because the room by the, 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 the game concept have no room for in-app purchases, or maybe because the game are just little, very small games, which are fun to play, but don't offer much depth. You know, I'm, I'm not saying those games are bad. You know, they, they, those games exist to meet a certain demand. Uh, they are there to meet the demand of what I call a, a quick gaming. You know, you just have a few minutes to spend. You just quick, you just play it for a few minutes. That's it. So obviously those games don't really support uh, easily in-app purchases and things like that. Uh, also, you have some ultra expensive blockbusters that cannot support, you know, freemium design. Uh, theoretically, they could, but usually the publishers don't want. They don't take the risk of investing like uh, 50 or 100 million dollars on a game and just releasing the game on, uh, as freemium only. And of course, uh, sometimes if you make a game on a, on a famous IP, then the IP owner doesn't want the game to be on freemium. So for all those reasons, you know, it's perfectly valid today not to go for uh, freemium design. Another reason also that will limit, I would say, the growth of freemium design is that some of the platforms are heavily saturated. And the result is that publishers or indie now are looking you know, for other platforms uh, to publish the games where the freemium is not necessarily overwhelming, at least not yet. Now, here I'm, I'm thinking of uh, uh, game consoles where most of the uh, games are sold not as uh, freemium products, but they are sold you know, under the traditional premium business models. Another problem also which has to do with freemium design is that it tends to homogenize game experience. This is super important, especially for you guys if you are uh, in, in game design. Uh, one of the things that we'll see today is that if you want your game to succeed uh, with the freemium business models, you have to follow some design rules, okay? The problem is that if you follow those rules too blindly, what will happen? The games will tend to look the same. Well, not look the same, graphically speaking, but they will play the same. And we already know this phenomenon. In other words, when we start playing some games, you know, whether it's on console or mobile and so on, you know, okay, the theme is different, the story is different, the characters is different, some gameplay elements are unique, but basically, you know, it's still the same kind of thing where you have to, you level up, you progress, you earn XP, you unlock stuff and so on, you know, so it looks awfully familiar. And that's very dangerous because we should, we, we, we are all aware that one of the things that get people to play games, especially new games, are games that bring new experiences. I will use this word a lot during my uh, masterclass today. Uh, obviously, game mechanisms are super important. I mean, you cannot build a good gameplay with that strong game mechanism, but we should never forget that people play games because essentially they are looking for a certain experience. 
they're looking, they, they're looking for thrills, they want to be afraid, they want to think, uh, they want you know, to be uh, seduced by the, by the graphics and so on. I mean, there are many reasons for which we play games. And one of them, probably the most important one, is you know, the, the emotions we get out of the game. And emotions come from the experience. And the experience, the one which is often driving us, is novelty. When you propose something new to the players, whether it's the, the theme, the game mechanism, the gameplay, even the art, people are automatically attracted to that. Why? Because we like novelties, we like new, new, new things. So even if your game is well crafted, you know, on all, all aspects of it, but it feels like something you've already seen, people will not play the game, not much. So this is why thinking that applying in a very rigid way, some of the rules on, on framing design you know, could lead to games that will just all look all the same. And again, this is very dangerous. This is something that could, you know, that will, uh, that could weaken the impact of framing design. So what I just tried to say today is that maybe I'm a bit uh, disturbing you today because you know, obviously the theme of the conference of this masterclass in framing design, and we'll go on that obviously, but what I'm trying to say right now is that actually, because if we are all here, is that you know, we want to make games, we want to make a living out of it, so we need to generate revenue. We also want people to play our games. And actually, you don't necessarily have to go for freemium. There are also alternative ways. And today, in my masterclass, you know, I want to give you a very broad view. In other words, when you will be in front of your, you know, your white page on defining you know, your game, uh, you'll ask yourself the question, okay, what kind of monetization strategy will I follow? Uh, and which, which, what platforms will I go and so on? You need to think really hard to those questions because obviously the, uh, don't necessarily follow what other people are doing. It is not because everybody goes on mobile and they're streaming games that you have to do the same. You have to be smarter than that. Depending on the emotions you want to create, depending on the game experience, you know, you might decide to go on different platforms and different business models. And today, hopefully, I will give you the keys to help you make the choices. So, before making any decisions in terms of game design, it is very important to understand the player. And in particular, you know, uh, yes, well, I will switch to that later on. So, if you're going to design a game, and you have, you have made the decisions of going freemium. Okay, great. It's very important to understand that um, those alternatives also exist. So today, I will essentially focus on film design, but also I want you to be aware of those alternatives, and this is what we'll talk about. So this is, you know, the content of the masterclass today. Uh, we're a bit short on time, so I don't know if I'll be able to cover everything. But essentially, you know, I'll begin by talking about, you know, the, 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 the basics, you know, what the, the few things that you, abs you have absolutely have to know, you know, in order to understand uh, the way to design free-to-play games. Then we'll obviously uh, talk about monetization strategies. We'll cover them all. We'll cover the strategies, you know, which are heavily focused on freemium design, but also other strategies. We'll talk about retention. Retention, it's a key word. It's even more important than the monetization strategy you follow. And retention, this is something that should be used essentially for two purposes. First, it is used, you know, to get players engaged into the game. This is called short-term retention or onboarding. And then retention strategy, it's also used to keep people, to keep players. Look at big success in terms of free-to-play uh, games, you know. They keep players for months, years, it's incredible, you know. So how do they do it? So retention, it is as important than selecting the right monetization strategy. And then we'll talk a little bit about the shop, what to sell and how not to sell it. So also going to briefly introduce myself. So you know my name, my, my name, I'm a game designer. I've been in this industry for nearly 23 years now. Obviously, when I started my career, I worked essentially on console, on console games. So these are the, some, some of the titles I've been working on. More recently, obviously, for the past 10 years, I worked essentially on mobile and Facebook titles. So touching anything from strategy, uh, match-free games, 
uh, social games and so on. And now I'm, I'm still doing free-to-play games, I'm still doing mobile games, but I'm also working on, uh, uh, I'm back on a console, PC, Steam, and hybrid, hybrid games, which shows that the market evolves. So basically, again, that's something which is, uh, you guys have to keep in mind. Um, in my experience, the industry changes every five, six years. Every five, six years, there's something new that comes here. In new technology, business models, distribution, game genre, and so on. You have to be always on the lookout, because if you don't pay attention to changes, you know, you just could die. I mean, not you, but I mean, your company. So that's, uh, and, and I'm fairly well positioned to see that because as I work as a freelance, so I meet the demands of my clients, which are either studios or publishers, and I can see the trend. So if more recently I've been essentially working on titles which are not mobile, it's also because I think you know, there's a ch change in trends. Let's start you know, with the first part, which is you know, understanding you know, what is key about free-to-play design. Again, I want to put the players at the center of everything. We do games for players, so we have to understand them. And in order to understand them, we have to know, you know to understand their behaviors. So, first of all, first thing to understand about players is that what is free will attract people, but it will not motivate people to, uh, to invest themselves in the game. Now, this is, it has to do with human psychology. It's very important to, to, to understand that. When you buy a product, anything, let's you buy a game, even if it's for a very, very small amount, okay, you are going to play longer with this game even if this game is not very good. Why? Because by spending money, you've made a choice. In other words, you've, you've decided, okay, this game is good enough, or I think it's good enough, so I'm going to put money into this game. And if, once you've made this purchase, you play the game, and if the game does not appear to be that good, well, you will still play the game because, well, you say, I've put money in it, I want to know, I want to make sure if, it's, uh, if, if I wasted it or not, and so on. Uh, and also, there's some issue about pride, because you've made this commitment. So, you know, we are all like that. When we make choices, you know, we don't like to be facing the fact that we were wrong. You know, this has to do with, uh, with, with mankind, you know, with, uh, with, other, with the way we, we view ourselves. You know, we don't like to be proven wrong. And that's exactly what happens when you sp spend money in a product, you know. Uh, it's going to take some time to admit that you put money in the wrong game. So the result is that when you buy a game, even if you put small money in it, you are going to play the game a certain time, you know, to make up your opinion and decide whether the game is bad or not. When games are free, you don't have this mechanism. In other words, you start the game, obviously things which are free, are, there's no barrier to entry. You, know, you don't pay anything, so it looks like it's super easy. And it is, actually. You know, that's one of the reasons that explain the, the massive success of games on mobile platforms and Facebook, because they are free. The problem is that if the game does not appear to be good, what happens? You give up. Very quickly. Sometimes within the first 30 seconds. Sometimes, you know, within, you play one day and then you, you, you never come back. And that's because, you know, you have not done this intellectual choice of committing yourself to the game. So the result is that, yes, having free games, it's great because you're attracting people to your product, but at the same time, you know, they're going to leave you very, very quickly. Another thing also that we have to know about players is that, as I said earlier on, very, very few players are uh, making any purchase in a game. It's just a few percent. Uh, again, uh, getting good metrics is kind of difficult, so I got those ones, which I think are reliable. The, those are coming from Appanese, and they show us that they have this uh, survey, uh, and they, they ask studios, you know, what percentage of their players make any purchase, and we can, we can see that over half of them, you know, just make only very, very few purchases in total. Another thing also that we have noticed regarding players' behaviors is that players that uh, play a lot of the game 
are the ones who tend to, make, to spend most of the money. In other words, there seems to be a relationship between the number of hours, weeks, months you play a game and the amount of money you're going to spend in it. In other words, if you want you know, to be able to generate money with the free-to-play games, you, game, you have to make sure that people will stay with you for months you know, or at least for weeks. Again, those statistics show that most of the money is spent by people who play more than 10 hours. Another thing also that has to do with the players' behaviors is that players have choice, obviously. I mean, not only because uh, on mobile platforms, the games are numerous, but also because there are other game platforms as well. So the result is that people, players, have the choice. That means that if they don't like what, what you do, you know, they can leave very, very quickly. So the result, you know, of so those things are very important to keep in mind. You know, remember, when you, when you design a game, always put the player at the center of your game design. Don't do a game for you. You do a game for other people. So understanding what's in their head is very important. So the consequences of that is that when you are a game designer and you have to design a game, which most likely will be freemium, you, know, you, have, you must have a few objectives in your mind at all times. Now, first of all, you, you, you have to attract people with the players of an exciting promise. Why am I saying that? There are lots of games outside, even within one genre. So why would player decide to pick up your game and not another one? One way to do that is to attract them with the promise of an experience. And it makes sense. Of course, sometimes we'll play games because somebody, a friend of us, told us about the game, great, or because we heard about it, okay, but most of the games, especially on mobile platforms, are selected by people who just simply, you know, they, they go to the, the App Store, Google Play, or maybe they, saw, they, 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 they show something, you know, on, you know uh, and they were looking for something, and say, oh, this game looks interesting, I will try it. So most of the time, you know, it's, because it's not out of luck, but it's out of curiosity that people will select the game. What will attract them to that game? It's because something in the game made them a promise. Maybe it's uh, the promise of a, a theme, promise of a gameplay, promise maybe of a, an environment, you know, or anything, you know, but somehow, you know, you say, oh, I want to try this game because, well, maybe it, uh, it's about medieval Japan. Voilà. Let's assume that I'm a fan of, of uh, medieval Japan society, and this game, you know, we'll talk about that. So I'm going to try this game, okay? I don't know if the game is, is good, but somehow, you know, I'm attracted by the theme. So we'll try the game. So somehow that means that when you promote the game and you, prom you promote it by the, the title, by maybe the, the, the icon, by screenshots, you know, you are making a promise to the player. Look, my game will talk about that. My game is promising to deliver that and that and that. So that means that, again, when you design the game, you have to take that into, in, into consideration. In other words, there must be something in your game concept that will naturally attract players. Another thing also that I have to keep in mind as a designer is that I want to make sure that my player that discovers the game will return for more. That has to do with short-term retention. Short-term retention, you know, it's a big issue in the industry. I will talk about it later on. But as you know, most people that discover a free-to-play game for the first time, they never come back. So what a waste. Remember, market is flooded with titles. Getting people attracted to your game is difficult. When you have the chance that players are actually test trying your game for the first time, this is great. You know, you absolutely want them to stay with you. So that means, as a game designer, your game has to be designed in such a way that the early phase of the game has to be super exciting. We call it onboarding. This is very, very important. I will speak much more about it later on. Also, as a designer, I want my players to play often 
over a long period of time. Why? Because I know that, as I explained earlier on, uh, when we talk about freemium design, games that will make the most money are games on which players will, will play for a long period of time. And if possible, I want them to play every day. So it's not only about how many hours of gameplay my players will play on my game, it's how often do they come back. Ideally, I want them to play every day. No. Now, why do I want that? Because my goal as a game designer is to make sure that the game becomes part of the player's life. Now, again, this is something which is important to understand. If you want to monetize a game, if you want to monetize free-to-play games, the game should not only be light entertainment. It has to become important for players. In other words, people will accept, will willingly spend money in a free games because the game has become so important to them that you know they say, yes, it's normal that I put money in it. This is super important to understand. And in order you know, to get that, people have to play the game very long. This is why, as we said earlier on, uh, experience show that the players who spend the most money in free-to-play games are those that, that play uh, very often over a long period of time. So that means that, as a game designer, I have to make sure that my game is designed in such a way that not only people will play every day, they'll play for a long time, but they'll, they'll return every day. Ideally, you know, I want my players, you know, to pick up their handphones in the morning, you know, uh, and during breakfast, you know, in the bus, you know, they connect to the game and do something. And when they come back at home in the evening, again, they pick up the, 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 the smartphones and interact with the game. That's my goal as a game designer. So that means that I have to design my, I have to design my games, the, 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 the game rules I will implement have to aim to those, uh, to those ends. Also something which should be in the back of my head is that I want to attract a lot of players all the time. Why do I want that? First of all, as I said earlier on, most players don't spend any money. So if you want to generate any money, obviously you need to have a large body of players. And uh, another thing also is that you are going to lose a lot of them. You will lose a lot of them the first day, but then you know, the retention is such that over the course of weeks, months, people will just leave the game, even if they enjoy playing it. So you need you know, to replenish your pool of players. So the result is that you have to plan your game in such a way that it's, it's going to naturally viralize. In other words, the game itself will be the best support for your marketing and for getting new, new people to play the game. So uh, the result of that, of those rules, is that as a game designer, you must always keep in the back of your mind those rules. When you make your design choice, ask the questions. Always, will this feature help attract players? Will the feature make sure the player will stay for a long time? Will I answer the player's promise and so on and so on? So that is something that should be in the mind of the designers. I insist on that because most, you know, we game designers, you know, we tend to focus on game mechanics, which kind of makes sense because the game mechanics, you know, it's like the engine of, of, of a car. Okay, With no, without engine, the car just will not go. Okay, but put yourself to the shoes of players or put yourself to the shoes of a, of a driver, you know? What will attract you to a car, to buy a car? It's outside, it's the overall feeling, you know? What happens when you sit on driver's seats? Are you excited? You know, what kind of emotion do you get, you know? You don't care about the engine. You know the engine is important, of course, but this is not what will drive you, you know, to actually buy the, buy the, buy the car. It's exactly the same here. And if you're game designers, you know, I just warn you against that. Yes, we need game mechanics, but first, always, think of the players. What does the player want? What is the player looking for? What kind of experience does he want to have? <clears throat> and then you define your game mechanics based on that. So, when you are designing a game, a free-to-play games, you know, as the designers, you have to plan to work on those free strategy. You need to define the monetization strategy. You need to define 
the retention strategies with an S because there are different retention, as I said earlier. Short term, medium term, long term retention. And then also you have to take into account acquisition strategy. In other words, how will you get new people to discover your game? So of course, you can do it by marketing. If you have the chance to have like a, uh, a publisher, the publisher maybe will put some money on the table you know, to uh, acquire traffic. It's very expensive. So most studios just cannot do it. That means that in order to get new people to play the game, you need to count only on the value of your titles and you know, the viral tools you have uh, uh, embedded into the into game to attract new players. So this is an issue I will not cover today. I don't have the time. Uh, and it's more about marketing. But those two clearly, you know, this is into the realm of a game designer. So now we have an idea of what players, how players behave. We have an idea of what in, the in their head. Now, comes the time, you know, to uh, define the monetization strategy. Um, first of all, what is this? Well, actually, what is important is that um, the monetization strategy in a game, it is not what you sell. It is how you convince players to spend money in a free game. When you think about this sentence, it looks something is wrong in the sentence. Why would people spend money in a free game? It doesn't make sense. But it works. So the question is how to convince people to spend money in a free game. This is the magic of monetization strategy. And again, the mistake that some studios do is that they do a game and they say, okay, now, what? let's sell items in the game to make some money. Okay? It doesn't work. It doesn't work because the game does not necessarily, you know, support all the features that will drive people, you know, to spend money in a free games. And that's the purpose of the monetization strategy. How to convince people you know, to spend money in a free games and to generate revenue. So what happened? So that's it. It's the way you construct the gameplay experience. This is what will drive people to spend money in a free games. So you see, it's not only it's not the content of the shop. It is something that you embed into the game system that will drive people at one point to spend money willingly. This is very important, you know. Obviously, if they feel forced to spend money in a game, what will happen? They will leave right away. Ah, this is bad. People spend willingly money in a free-to-play free games because you know, they, they almost see that, you know, they say that this is really worth it. You know? uh, they don't have the feeling that somebody you know, is kind of you know, putting a knife on their throat. You know? No, this is very bad. The game is, done, the game is done in such a way that people will willingly spend money, and that's the magic of the good strategy. And we'll see how, it, how this thing can be done. So how can we drive play players to spend money in a free games? So there are many, many strategies. Uh, I will cover them all, OK, at fairly high level. Uh, my idea here is just to give you like a complete, it's like a toolbox. In other words, once you have all the strategies possible, when you know them all, then it's much easier you know, to make the choice and define which ones you want to go on. So first of all, there's one family of strategies, which is, you all know it, you know, is to generate frustration. Now frustration, well, is it bad? Sounds like bad, eh? We don't like to be frustrated, do we? Okay. But when you think about it, actually most games rely on some kind of frustration, including games that you buy full price. Uh, um, what's the core gameplay mechanism? It's challenge. Challenge means that you are going to put the player in front of a difficulty, and he's going to have dif he's, it's going to, he's going to have a hard time to pass your difficulty, to pass the challenge. You know, he will fail. He will try again. He'll fail again, and so on. But he will continue. So there is some frustration, and actually, frustration is important. Because if there's no frustration, that means we can get what you want right away. You can finish the level, beat the boss, level up without effort. And that removes all the value. If there was no frustration, all the mechanism we use 
to get people you know, to play and play again and spend hours, weeks with a game, it just would not work. So we need frustration. So this is what you know, uh, I want to stress out, that frustration sounds like something which is awful, but actually, you know, it's already part of what we do. So it turns out also that it's probably the most effective way to get people to spend money in the free games. The trick is how to make it acceptable to players. It's especially tricky uh, if you want to avoid what is called pay-to-win. Pay-to-win is something which I recommend against. It's that basically, uh, if you want to progress in the game, if you want to be stronger, you know, you need to, to spend real money. So this is something which, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, especially if you are targeting um, uh, hardcore gamers, you know, this is something that should uh, never be done. But in any case, what I want to say here is that you can have frustration in the free-to-play games as long as, you know, as it's well introduced. And this is what we're going to see now. So, how can you generate frustrations? There are different tactics that can be followed. The first one is you, you it's very popular, it's what I call resource limitation. In other words, the game will limit the number of actions you can do, or it will somehow, you know, make some actions very, very long to do. So one good example, you know, is Cityville. In Cityville, you've got like a, a, a action points, I would say, and in, the, in your city, you need to spend action points to do nearly everything, to, uh, uh, to, to uh, pick up the resources generated, you know, by, uh, by a, a shop or uh, uh, building something, anything. So nearly everything you do in this city requires an, uh, energy points. So of course, at first, you've got plenty of it. But eventually, when you have a big city, when you've got plenty of buildings, fields that generate resources, you know, then very quickly, you know, you discover that, you know, you don't, you never have enough action points to do everything you want. So that creates frustration. This is frustration based, you know, on uh, uh, the, the number of events, the number of actions you can do. But also another very popular way is just to use time. Like in Clash of Clans, when you upgrade anything, there's an upgrade time, which can be very long. You know, like in that case here, I'm upgrading like this barracks, you know, I have five hours left before it's completed. This one, 18 hours, okay. Now, in these examples, you know, the periods are short. They can get much, much longer. Again, I'll take the example of Clash of Clans. Just look how long it takes to do some upgrades. Like for a barbarian, you know, at first upgrades are very fast. And then eventually, you know, to upgrade to level eight, <clears throat> it will take 10 days. Gold mine, it's the same. To reach the highest level, it is six days of upgrade for one gold mine. And you've got six gold mines in the game. So for each of them, you have to go through, or no, you have to go through those steps. And for the city hall, you know, it's even worse, 14 days. So you see, clearly, you know, this is frustrating. You play the game, you farm resources, you know, because you want to upgrade your buildings, and then when you have the resources, okay, you still need to wait hours, days, weeks before you can get the result. Clearly, this is frustrating. This is the very effective way. Frustrating people uh, on time, it's very, very effective. So here, what's the underlying mechanism is that basically it's impatience. You know, we are all impatient. So impatience, you know, this is what is actually driving people, you know, to, uh, to, to, to go faster and uh, spend real money in free to play games. Problem, well, the benefit also is that it's fairly easy to design. It's easy to tune also. Problem, it is not adapted at all to hardcore games or mid-core games. Let's, let's see now another strategy. I call it progression trees. In progression trees, basically, the player can play as long as he wants. No limitation, you know, on the number of actions, on the time you spend, and so on. However, in, that, in those kind of games, it's like in any, any RPG, you start very low, 
and you understand very quickly that you know, in order to progress in the game, you need to unlock new features and unlock and unlock and unlock. You discover that there are progression trees which are very vast. In other words, you've got plenty of choice and so on. This is what we've seen you know, in many RPG, MMO, and so on. So, and obviously, you cannot select what you want to uh, unlock. If you want to unlock a feature, you need to unlock the one before and so on. And obviously, items in those progression trees are increasingly expensive to get. So, one example here, I'll take World of Tanks. When the, it's a free-to-play game, of course, when you start the game, you've got uh, three tanks. You know, usually they are very small, not very interesting, like, like one here, okay? There's one free tank per nation. So obviously, when you start playing the game, you clearly want to upgrade to get a, another tank, and you discover that the game has progression trees. So for instance, this is the, the German tanks branch. So you start with this little tank you know, that nobody wants, okay? And then you understand, aha, okay, once I have enough resources, I can unlock all those tanks. And then you discover that actually the tree is huge. Is huge. Now this is you know, the complete progression tree just for German tanks. And you've got all those nations in the game. So you see what I mean. When you start the game, you say, oh my god, you know, uh, I've got plenty of things I can unlock. And clearly, people think, well, when I will unlock tanks, when I will, I will get tanks here, obviously, they'll be much more powerful than there. So this is a strong motivation to invest yourself. You say, OK, if I invest myself to the game, you know, I will unlock one after another, and eventually, I will get some very interesting uh, vehicles. They go beyond than that in World of Tanks, because also every tank has its own progression trees. You can upgrade the tracks, the engine, the radio, the guns, sometimes the turret, and so on. So every tank has its own smaller progression tree. And the crew also can be upgraded. Every crew, every crew member has its own skills, you know, for the, the, the commander of the tank, it's the, 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 the distance at which it can spot enemies. For the gunner, it's accuracy and so on. So every crew member has its own um, uh, attribute, but then you can also add extra attributes to every single crew member. And the result is that you also upgrade the crew members. How does it translate in terms of time? Well, clearly, you know, you can see on this graph, which shows the price. Here, I just took one small branch. I took the French tanks, and within the French tanks, I just took, you know, the reconnaissance tanks. And you can see, you know, the progression in terms of resources you need to earn. So you start with this one, the Renault FT, okay, which is a free tank which is given to you. Then to unlock the next one, you only need to earn 3,800 uh, silver coins, which is like the the, the, the soft currency in the game. Then the third one, it costs 4,200. And then look at this one, 41,000. In other words, between here and there, it's a tenfold increase. And look at the curve. Eventually, for this one, you need to spend nearly 2.4 million silver coins. So obviously, you understand that here the progression will be fast. Here it's going to be much, much longer. And it works. World of Tank, it's one of the best examples in terms of monetization, in terms of everything. The retention rate is amazingly good, uh, especially in the long term. Uh, the transform transformation rate is very good. Transformation rate is the percentage of your players which spend, which make at least one purchase in the game. It's very high, it's nearly 30%. It's probably one of the highest in the industry. So that's amazing because it means that if you succeed in uh, applying some of the rules we've seen, uh, and we'll see it later on in terms of game design, then you can really make a lot of money with free-to-play games. In spite of the fact this is a hardcore game and it's pretty complex. So here, what is frustrating in this mechanism is that clearly the further you progress along the branches of the um, progression tree, the more resources you need to get what you want. So at first, you level up pretty quickly. It doesn't take time to unlock new features. And then the more you play, the more time it takes. And obviously, eventually, you get frustrated and say, oh, I really want to unlock that tank. 
So, okay, I'm going to spend uh, uh, hot currency, I'm going to spend real money, you know, to speed up my progress and unlock the tank I want to get. So you see, frustration exists, but it's longer term. In other words, this frustration will be much more effective, you know, not early in the game, but much later on. The benefit of this strategy is that it works beautifully with hardcore gamers. Hardcore gamers, you know, they hate to be artificially stopped in the game because they don't have enough time or resources and so on. You know, they want to be able to play as much as they want. They want to be able to play the whole night and enjoy the game. So this is why the previous strategy of resource limitation do not work with hardcore gamers. This one works much better with hardcore gamers. The problem is that it works only with games that can support big progress retreats. That means that your game must have a lot of depth to support it, which obviously limits you know, the number of genres which can support this strategy. A third strategy to generate frustration is what I call decreasing yield. This is a less known strategy. It can be also quite effective. In this strategy, the idea is that it's, it becomes more and more difficult to keep your earning. So far, in the different situations I explained to you, whether it's a city bill or, or clash of clans or wall of tanks, you understand that you do a lot of farming. You know, in other words, you play, you earn resources, and when you have enough of those resources, then you can upgrade what you've got, okay? So that means that you've got this idea that the players, you know, is kind of built up. You know, it's a pile of resources, great. In the games which are using the decreasing yield strategy, you're having to lose that. In other words, when you reach a certain level, you know, it's going to be more and more difficult to keep the resources that you have earned. And I'm going to show you examples so you understand how it works, and you will see why it is so effective. So I'll take two examples. I will start first with World of Tanks. In World of Tanks, how does, how does, how does the game work? It's very simple. It's a multiplayer game, 15 versus 15. You, you select a tank, you go in combat, you earn um, resources, you know, the silver coins I explained to you. You earn them by inflicting, inflicting damages to enemy tanks, and you also earn uh, these resources, you know, when your team completes win the, match, win the match. Which means that at the end of any match, you've got like a, uh, a summary of the battle, and the game tells you what you've earned. So for instance, this one, I'm sorry it's in French because I can only play the French version. Basically, you have earned, you know, 18,390 silver coins. Okay, this is what you've earned because of, you know, what you've done during the combat, you know, your performance. Great, okay. The problem is that when you play further on into the game, you get more powerful tanks, okay? That's, that's what is driving you forward. You play the game because, you know, you want to level up and you want to be able to access, you know, those higher level tanks. Great. The problem is that those tanks, they cost money. They cost money to repair. They cost money to replace. The ammunition costs money. And the result is that, I'll just show you, you know. In this combat, for instance, look, you know, I, I earn 5,900 silver, uh, silver coin. This is because, you know, I inflicted damage to the enemy vehicle, great. But look at that. I had to repair my vehicle. I had to replace the ammunition. And those are very expensive. So the result, it's net. It's a loss. In other words, on this combat, I have lost money. So can you imagine that? You play a game, you play very long, you know, you, you, you play because you expect to unlock those nice tanks, you know, and you get into combat and you actually lose money. Of course, not real money, but game money, you know. So this is incredibly frustrating. This strategy kicks in later on into the game. In other words, when you start playing the game at the lower level, you know, it doesn't matter. You always, because the tanks you have are inexpensive, repairs are cheap, ammunitions are very cheap, so it doesn't matter, you know. Uh, you always end up, even if your tanks was destroyed, even, even if your team lost the match, it doesn't matter, you will still earn some uh, uh, silver coins by the, by the end of the game. 
but in higher levels. It's not the case. If you don't play well, you know, you end up losing money in those kind of games. So you understand this is incredibly frustrating. I mean, maybe you, 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 you I think very few games are using this strategy, but it is incredibly effective because you understand that obviously when you reach that, that, that level, most people would just throw away, you know, the gamepad or stop playing the game, you know. They don't here. That means that, you know, it's, it works. Why does it work? Because this strategy kicks in much, much later into the game. And at that stage, when you've been playing the game for months, you know, you know that uh, if, you, if you lost in a combat, it's essentially because of you, because you made a mistake. So you don't blame the game, you blame yourself. You, you, you learn from your mistake, and you say, ah, next time I will not do this mistake, or I will change my tactics in combat, and so on. So in spite of that, in spite of the fact that this is super frustrating, you accept this system, because you know it forces you to improve your gameplay. This is very hardcore-ish. It doesn't work, obviously, with casual or mid-core games, but if you are targeting hardcore gamers, it works. Another implementation of this strategy, it's more surprising, is Clash of Clans. So Clash of Clans is more mid-core, okay? Actually, the game started as a, maybe almost like a casual game, and as it grew, you know, it becomes more mid-core, you know, it's a fairly complex game. But also those guys, they're using the same strategy. They're also using this decreasing yield strategy. How does it work? So you know, in Clash of Clans, you're, the whole game rests on your village, so you, you built a village that you have to protect. Uh, in order, you know, to upgrade your village and upgrade your armies, you need, you know, to get resources so you can grow your own resources with your gold mines and so on. But also, you know, the best way to earn more resources is simply just to take them away from other players. So you attack other players' villages and you steal their resources, okay? And obviously, they can attack you and so on. So that's how the game works. Now, what happened in this game? Remember, Earlier on, we saw, you know, the different threshold to upgrade soldier and buildings. So not only upgrading buildings in that game requires uh, time, but also it requires resources. Resources, you know, can be anything, uh, any of the soft currency they have, which can be uh, gold or uh, those uh, purple and black uh, uh, fluid, which is like a bit, uh, anyway, so. Um, so in order, you know, to uh, upgrade your constructions, your soldier, whatever, you know, that game, you need to amass a lot of it, which means that eventually when you are further into the game, you need to amass a lot of resources, you know, to be able to upgrade something. But what happened? Remember what I said earlier on. People can attack you, all right? And if they attack you, obviously, they do it for one purpose, just to steal your resources away. So put yourself into the shoes of the player. The player wants to upgrade something, okay? He needs to amass a lot of resources to be able to buy the upgrade. So he's going, you know, to pile up resources, you know. He stores he store the resources in his inventory. Maybe he's going to attack other players to get some loot and so on. So he's piling up his resources in order to do the upgrade. But then he gets attacked. And who is going to attack him? Well, when you decide in this game to launch an attack, you can select your target. And one of the first things you, you say, you look at that. You know, this is, you know, the potential loot that I will get if I attack this player. This is not my village. This is the village, you know, of a potential uh, uh, of another player which can become a potential target for me. So here the, I say, that gives me an idea of you know, how much resources I can earn if I loot this village. And if I don't think it's enough, I can go to another village. Like this one, you know, oh, this one has much more. Oh, this, this village, you know, if I attack this village, I can earn that much of the purple uh, fluid. So I'm going to attack this village. So you see the point. You see where the strategy of decreasing yield works, is that in order to progress in the game, you need to amass a lot of resources, but the more you have, the bigger target you become. So you keep being attacked constantly 
by powerful players who attack you, you know, just to rub away all the things you've got, you, you have uh, uh, amassed over the time. And that means that sometimes it can take a lot of time to, to keep up enough resources to do an upgrade because people keep attacking you and st stealing it away from you. So clearly, you know, you see what the frustration is. This kind of frustration does not happen early on in the game. It happens much later. But clearly, you know, it's a real source of frustration. So here, what is making this frustration works is that the further you into the game, the harder it becomes to keep what you've earned. This is what we've seen in World of Tanks, and this is what we've seen in Clash of Clans. And you know, I'm selecting those examples, I and mean, first of all, because there are a few games that follow this strategy, but those games are immensely successful. World of Tank, you know, it's one of the most successful free-to-play games that exist. It's successful in terms of number of players, but in terms of money they generate, it's absolutely insane. And obviously, Clash of Clans, you know, it's one of the top grossing game on, uh, on, on mobile platforms. It has been like that for years and years. So this strategy, they work. They sound incredibly frustrating, but in spite of that, you know, they do work. So those strategies are clearly very effective at generating frustration. I think you, 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 you agree with me. Uh, very good for hardcore gamers, okay? But obviously, don't use decreasing yield with casual gamers. It just, you just never work, okay? So far, we've seen, I would say, like the, the most hard, you know, the most, can I say, intrusive strategies that you can have that rest on frustration. There are other strategies which also rest on frustration, but are, I would say, a bit milder. The first one is what I call restricted access. In restricted access, you have free access to the game, but only to a limited version of the game. In other words, if you want to play the full game, you need you know, to spend uh, some extra money. So one example, it's a Dofus. Dofus, it's an, an MMO. It's an online. Uh, it's a turn-based strategy, so very good games. In spite of the fact you know, it's just 2D and turn-based, basically, you know, it's like all the MMO we know. But the difference is that this one, you know, it's just turn base. So Dofus have been immensely successful, largely because they've been following this strategy of restricted uh, access. And I'll give you the difference between what you get when you play the game uh, as a free player and what you get if you, buy, if you pay. So in the restricted version of the game, you, uh, you cannot access the whole game. You, only, you can only play in limited areas. You have access to two dungeons only. And dungeon, you know, this is where you actually do the combat. You know, this is the, mm, the heart of it. And you also have the in-game chat. If you buy the full version of the game, then you get much more. You have access to the whole content of the game. You have also access to all the dungeon, of course. Access to the dungeon, the dungeon. assuming you have, you've got a key, of course. You know, it's, I'm not saying it's unlimited access, but at least potentially you can access the entire uh, game. You have access to in-game trades. You can access to guilds. You have access to the PvP area and so on. So clearly, you know, there's much more here to offer than in that version. And here, it works beautifully well, you know, because clearly the game is free, okay? The game offers enough for you to play for weeks, you know, without really feeling the limitation. And eventually, you know, when you are really into the game, when you started to level up your character, you, you, know, you know, you start to, you know how the game works, uh, you have uh, your character, you know, has some interesting weapons and so on, then you decide, you know, or some players decide to go for the, uh, to pay and get the full access of the game. And the frustration also here has to do, you know, with the social dimension of the game. As you know, usually you don't play those games by yourself. You play them, you know, the group of people. You do a dungeon together and so on. So the thing is that by playing the free game, you start to build your community, your friends and so on. Um, and the problem is that if you want to do more, more with them, then you eventually you need to spend some money and buy, you know, access to the full game. So that works pretty well because um, it's, it allows you to discover the game Okay, play as much as you want. And if you're really hooked, if you like the game, 
If you want to go further, you go for, uh, you decide to go and buy, you know, the access to all game. It sounds a lot like subscription, right? But it's not, because there are two differences. The first one is that, and those differences you'll see, they are minor, but they're important. How does typical subscription work? You give your banking details, your Visa card, whatever you know, and every month, you know, the game provider, whatever you know, will debit certain money from your account, all right? In restricted access, it doesn't work like that. You don't buy for an uh, unlimited debit, you know? You just buy for a, 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 a limited period of time. In other words, you are going to buy a pack of month. For instance, you're going to buy unlimited access for three months, six months, 12 months maybe, okay? That's it. In other words, you know exactly what you buy. And you know that when the period will be over, then you're not going to be charged again. You will need to buy another pack. Now, it sounds like a detail, but this is very important for parents. When you're a parent, you hate, you know, to, 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 to use your, 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 your credit cards, you know, uh, and subscribe your children to something like that because you might forget. So, you know, the money will be debited every month, you forget about it, you know, and maybe your children doesn't play the game anymore, but it doesn't matter, you know, the money will, will go away. And some people also don't like, you know, to give your, their, their, their banking details to a game company. The benefit of that is that, you know, for parents is very reassuring because he buys to his, to his, to his, to his uh, children, you know, an access for a given number of months, and he knows that, you know, he's never going to be bothered anymore. By, 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 um, uh, by the system that will draw money from his account. So he has this peace of mind. This is very important. Another benefit also of restricted access compared to re regular subscription is that once you have ceased to have access to the full version of the game, you can still play the game. You know, you still have your friends. You can still do things with them. Of course, the rest of your friends can play the entire games. You are restricted, but you can still interact with them. So that's also something which is very important because even if you don't have money <coughs> to, you know, to play, to, to buy all those, uh, all those months, you know, you can just buy me for one month and uh, then uh, after the month you can uh, you resume playing, not having access to the features, but you can still play. And then maybe later on you will buy another pack of months and so on, you know. So it's much more flexible. This is the big difference with subscription, which is not necessarily a bad system. But subscription is very rigid. Restricted access, you know, it's very flexible in the sense that it's much more user-friendly, I would say, than pure subscription. So this is why I'm mentioning it. And clearly, obviously, uh, frustration, you know, do, do, do exist here. But it's, you know, it's, it's much, much lower. You know, it's not as bad as in what we've seen previously. The benefit of this system is that it has a low impact on the overall game architecture. One of the problems, I haven't mentioned it yet, but think of uh, what I've seen, what I explained previously. It requires, you know, uh, that you, you embed your monetization strategy into the game system, whether it's a resource limitation or whether it's a decreasing yield and so on, you know, you have to plan that into a game system. So that means that the, your strategy to monetize the game has an impact on your game system. If you're going, for restricted access, you know, you don't really do that. In other words, you can embed this monetization strategy, you know, in a game without changing in depth its, uh, its game system. Another thing also is that, this is important, players, you know, will not feel the pressure to buy items. Because this is something that can turn people off. If the monetization strategy is too aggressive, people will leave. This is a mistake, an error that has been done by some publishers. Uh, they wanted absolutely, you know, to generate money. They did not understand how monetization for free-to-play games work, and uh, they put restriction too early on players. The result is that people discovered, oh, uh, if I want to play the game, I understand that I have to spend some money, so I just quit. I don't play the game. This is bad. If you do a free-to-play game, you have to take the risk of being generous. In other words, you have to, to accept that people will play the game, will enjoy themselves for weeks, for months, without spending any money. And sometimes it is difficult to uh, make people you know, understand that if they're not gamers themselves. Because you know, when you talk to somebody you know, who is uh, an investor and say, well, we'll make a free game, 
they say, well, okay, how do we make money? You know, they don't, it's hard for them to understand that. And the result is that some games have failed, not, I mean, some free games have failed, not because they were poorly designed, but simply, you know, because they were, they, they, uh, the, the, the game tuning was done in such a way that people resented that situation. They, they felt the pressure much too early. So here, the pressure is pretty low. The problem in that kind of, is the difficulty with this strategy is how to define, you know, where do you draw the line between what is free and what is not. If you are too generous, then nobody will go for the uh, full version. If you are not generous enough, people will just will not play the game. So that's a difficult design choice to do. Furthermore, this is not adapted to all games. This is perfect for games, you know, which are RPG based or MMOs or maybe some shooter games, but it's not adapted to most genres. Another strategy you can also use to create frustration, and it, it, again, it becomes less and less intrusive, is episodic content. So episodic content, we all know it. You know, the, usually this is used for um, uh, um, games with a strong narrative. The game is sold in episode. Sometimes the first episode is free, and then the, the rest of the episodes can be buy, but usually at a moderate price. So, just some examples, you know, that we know. Now, here, I'm using that as an option, because it is true that today, this uh, strategy is used essentially for a narrative games, okay? But actually, you know, nothing prevents it from using it from other kind of games. I'm, to I'm talking of the strategy to monetize, obviously. It's possible, you know, to adapt this system to other games as well. So the result is that I think that this episodic content, you know, is something that is obviously it doesn't fit all the game genre, but for some titles, you know, I think it can work uh, quite well. And the frustration here, this is why I'm adding it to my presentation, to my master class, it is if the game is well done, clearly you've got things that at the end of the episode makes you want to play the other one. Usually there's a cliffhanger. So that's one, that's how they create frustration, like in, in TV series. Another thing also which creates frustration is the way the story is embedded into the, uh, the whole episode. Uh, they have what is called a narrative arcs. In other words, they've got stories which are, uh, which takes place over several episodes. So that's another reason that you might, you might want to buy episodes. So it does work pretty well. Obviously, those games are story-driven, but again, I think that those, this strategy could be adapted to other genres as well. So generating, strategy, generating frustration, you know, it's one family of strategy you can use to implement uh, free-to-play uh, games. Now, another big strategy, of course, is to sell cosmetic items. This is a very classic one. Now, uh, again, I'm mentioning those because one of the conclusions I will come later on is that when you guys will have to define your monetization strategy, you know, most likely you are going to make a mix of them. So it's interesting, you know, to know them all, and de depending on your game, you can choose, you know, the one which are best adapted to what you do. So, uh, cosmetic, here you all know how it works. You can sell items in the game, that are only used, you know, for, uh, to dress up your avatar, your vehicle, or whatever, you know, but have absolutely no impact on the gameplay. So, the good thing is that this is suitable for absolutely all audiences. Even a hardcore game like World of Tanks is selling cosmetics, you know. And it's especially surprising in that game because in World of Tanks, it's a game which is, it, um, it, it's a, a distance combat game, essentially. Most of the time, you know, you fight enemies which are very far away from you. So you don't see them in details. And in spite of that, World of Tanks, they sell, you know, little things that you can stick to your tank and nobody will see. It's just for your own pleasure. Just because you like your tanks and you want to personalize them. So it works in that kind of, in that kind of situation. Um, the problem is that basically it does not generate much revenue. When you sell items in a game, essentially you can sell three kind of items. You can sell cosmetic items. You can sell resources, like we've seen in Clash of Clans, you know, like uh, you need resources, you know, to, to upgrade your th things. Or you can buy, uh, you can sell items that have an impact on gameplay. Now, in terms of revenue generating, 
this is the order of effectiveness. Cosmetic gets, uh, uh, generates the least resources. Resources, it's in between. And the kind of items, the item, uh, the in-app purchases that uh, generate most revenue are the items that have an impact on, on gameplay. In other words, items that will just improve or change your performance in combat in multiplayer. So that's the order, you know, in terms of effectiveness. So that means that Cosmetic, yes, it looks like an easier solution, okay, to gain some money. Unfortunately, it is not the most effective one. Another strategy you can also implement is just to sell DLC. So DLC, you all know, the game can be sold at full price, and then you can buy, you can sell extra, uh, extra content. So it can be anything, packs of map, this is what we've seen in games like Call of Duty, okay? Game modes, like in The Division, Ubisoft, or entire games like Waste My Water. So I'll just show you two examples which I find especially interesting. First, I'll take Arma Free. So Arma, you know, it's a, 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 a infantry combat simulation made by Bohemia Interactive. Uh, Arma Free has been out for nearly five years. They still, they still sell the game, it's amazing. People buy the game because of the DLC. In other words, they know that by buying the game, they have access to all that. And basically, they have a pack of DLC every nine, every 10 months, you know, they have a new DLC which is being sold. So thanks to that, they maintain, you know, the game active. No, now it's, it's the end, you know, I think they reach, they, they reach it, you know, uh, they reach the end of, the, of, of that, what they can do with, with the, this game engine. But it's amazing that this game, you know, has hold on for so long, essentially because of the DLC. Another example is Where's My Water, super famous game published by, by Disney. So when you start, when you buy the game, you have, it works a little bit like, uh, like Candy Crush, you've got within the game, you've got a bunch of scenarios, okay? A bunch of situations. But then within the game, you can buy extra games. And this is what you get. So of course, all those are different games, but you buy them within the main game. In other words, if you want to buy those sub games, you need to buy the first one. So again, it's a good example of how DLC can be used, you know, where DLC is not something, it's not like a different game. It's completely embedded into the main game. So that's what I said, okay. So the good thing about DLC is that, obviously it generates some revenue, but more importantly, it keeps the game alive. It's very important, remember what I said earlier on. Competition is very, very tough. The market is completely flooded. So if you have the chance that your game is successful, you know, you want people to keep it in mind. You want people to be aware that, yes, this game exists, and maybe this, you know, it's still there. And the more people play the game, the more chances you have that eventually you will generate some money. So keeping a game presence high is super important. And clearly with DLC you can do it. Because people who buy the game, when a new DLC uh, is out, they might not buy it, but you know, maybe they will start playing the game again. Or they will tell their friends and so on. Remember what I said earlier on. When you think, when you are working on the concept of a game, don't focus only on the game mechanics. You also have to take into account how you're going to market the game, how you're going to communicate on the game, how you're going to monetize it. And typically DLC is perfectly done for that. DLC will help keeping, you know, your communication active for the game. And obviously the DLC can lead to the sale of the core game. This is what happened with, with Arma Free. In Arma Free, they keep selling the game at full price because of the DLC, which is pretty an amazing fit. Then we've got advertising. Oh, that's also a big classic again. So advertising, essentially what it is, can be, you know, banners. So part of the screen, you know, is blocked, is, uh, by, well, you display uh, some kind of advertising on part of the screen. You've got interstitial. For instance, when you, when you, uh, you lose the game before going to the main menu, then you've got a full page ad. And you've got reward videos, with videos that you can trigger in order, you know, to unlock something in a game. See? Now, the thing is that advertising does not generate that much money. 
So I got those statistics, which are kind of interesting. It shows, you know, you know the uh, revenue generated, you know, uh, worldwide, but not only on games, okay? It's all apps. And what we can see, this is interesting, is that in red, here you've got ads which are just bought. In other words, this is the premium business model, okay? Remember, this is not only games. This, this covers everything. So you can see that it's climbing up, but it's kind of leveling up, you know? Okay. Then in blue, this is free-to-play games, games that have, have uh, in-app purchases. Look at that. It's exploding in terms of size, in terms of volume. And then green is advertising. True, it's growing, growing pretty fast, but still remains much, much smaller. And that's the truth. Advertising, you know, actually does not generate much money uh, in a game. It can work if your game is already very successful. In other words, if you've got, if you've got like a hundred thousands of people who play your game every day, then yes, advertising will become like a, 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 will generate a lot of revenue. Otherwise, it will not. So I'm saying that because some studios who are reluctant to adapt the game to the freemium business model, they say, well, we'll, we'll make money by selling ads. You know. Well, no. <laughs> it will generate some money, but very, very little. Don't count on that. However, <coughs> it can be a nice way to complement your main source of, of revenue. Another technique also, which might surprise you, it's merchandising. Merchandising, you know, it's selling uh, real, real life items, you know, beside the game. So this is something which has been around for many years. And if I'm mentioning it today, it's also because now it's at the reach of indie studios. In other words, you don't necessarily need to be a big studio, a big publisher, you know, to do that. Today, it's possible for even very small companies, very small studios, you know, to do some merchandising as well. So just a few examples. Uh, Bandai Namco has a huge, actually has a, a huge uh, um, uh, website with dedicated page, pages dedicated to, to different games. Blizzard is also uh, doing it, of course. Um, uh, Ankama, publishers of Dofus, is a real, uh, has been really good on that. Uh, they sell, you know, things like uh, uh, books and uh, 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 they have uh, um, plenty of games and so on, you know. So, Everything, many, many products are derived from their uh, Dofus uh, environment. Uh, Angry Birds also, this is probably the, the world champion in terms of merchandising. There was a point when 20, uh, about five years ago, where 45% of all the revenues of Rovio were coming from merchandising. It's huge. When you go to Finland, everything is Angry Birds. You've got ang Angry Birds everywhere. You even have uh, theme parks, theme parks, uh, Angry Birds theme parks. So, uh, again, here I'm selecting examples of big companies, but now there are even smaller studios that are also doing that. If your game works well, people like the game, so they'll be happy, you know, to have like a, um, uh, for, for their smartphones, you know, the, the shell to protect it, or maybe to have the mug or a t-shirt, you know. It's not very expensive now to manufacture those. And for the logistics, some companies also can help you. You can even have your own uh, online shops. Very simple to do. So that can be one way, you know, to complement your revenues. So what we've seen so far is that we've seen all, you know, the possible monetization strategy you can use in a game. So of course, most of them are premium based, but I wanted to stress out that there are alternative strategy. The question is that, what to do now? In other words, how can you practically use them to define your strategy for your own game. Something which is very important in today's industry, it's the merging of monetization strategy. So that's the first thing I want to stress out. For your games, most likely you will not go for a single strategy. You most likely are going to merge them. I'll just give you a few interesting examples. First of all, obviously this is like a AAA titles. Uh, Rainbow Six Siege. This game is interesting because I'm mentioning as an example because they are very smart in doing it. What happened? The game, you buy it full price, okay? So you probably know the theme of the game. You know, it's a, it's a, a multiplayer combat game. You've got two teams. Um, 
uh, one team is attacking, the other team is defending. The theme, you know, it's a combat between the uh, special forces and, and terrorists, okay? But it doesn't really show like that because basically in the game, uh, people on both sides, you know, they are using the same kind of, of equipment and so on. So anyway, you've got two teams, one which is defending, the other one which is attacking, okay? So the game is sold as a premium title. In other words, you buy the game full price. But then every six months, they've got free DLC. Now what's in the DLC? And this is where things are very smart. This game is about combat. You have one character, and the game offers different characters. They call, uh, they call them operators. Each operator is very different from each other. So operators, this is what makes the game interesting because every operator has its unique weapons, has its unique abilities, unique equipment, and so on. So the result is that you can, the game will play completely different, differently depending on the operator you select. Every six months you've got in the DLC, what do they have in DLC? They don't have maps, no. In the free DLC they've got new operators, all right? Usually two or four. Because the game rests essentially on those operators, that means that the DLC is highly valuable to players, all right? Because they know that with every new DLC, they will get, you know, they will enhance the way to, they're, they're in, they, they, will, they will not enhance, but I mean, they will, it's going to renew their experience in the game. So people don't download them, okay? They are free, all right? Why are they free? Well, so everybody has it. In other words, if I play in a game, so even if I, haven't, uh, uh, even if I don't use the operators, uh, I can be present in a game session where other players are using it. So this is why it is super important to make, to make it free. But where's the trick? The thing is that you download those operators, but you can use them right away. In order to use them, you need to earn points, like, X, like XP. So you earn those points by playing the game, and when you have enough of those points, then you can unlock some of those operators. So clearly this is very frustrating, because every six months you get, you, every six months you get ex, exciting content, okay? But you cannot use it. You will see other players using it, okay? So this is immensely frustrating. And uh, of course, by playing the game, so you know, you can just unlock the content, but many people, you know, are just too impatient. So what they do is that they buy a feature, you know, that allow them to unlock all the operators. So that's how, you know, they are making, you know, money by selling in the game um, uh, the item that allow players to unlock all the content of the game. So this is very smart. Also, they sell a cosmetic, you know, but cosmetic, you know, don't make much difference, you know. Uh, actually, they don't generate much money. What generates a lot of money in this game is this one. Faster unlock of new operators. So you see, what those guys have done is very smart because they have a lot of DLC. Every six months, you know, it's a good, uh, it's a good rhythm. So they keep the game alive. Uh, they keep the community excited. They bring something which has a lot of value to players. But at the same time, they succeeded, you know, in transforming that, you know, uh, in generating new revenue by making it difficult to, you know, use those extra uh, content. Another interesting example also is Elder Scrolls Online. Initially, it started as a, as a, as a regular MMO, which was uh, subscription-based. They gave up on that, and they, f they, they went for, I think it's a very interesting mix of strategies. The game is sold as premium, but I call it discounted premium. In other words, you pay very low. For a full price game, for a, for a full size game, you can buy the game for like, I think it's 15 or 20 euros, you know, which is about the same in, uh, in terms of dollars. So that's not much, because for this price, you get like a full size game on, uh, on, on console. But then, you've got plenty of DLC. And you know, they monetize by selling this DLC. So they've got free, frequently, like, like every two or three months, or every two months, you know, they put up a new DLC, new content. So this is pretty smart, because they attract people to a good game 
by selling a full feature game at a low price. And then, you know, they sell, generate a lot of money by selling extra DLC. They also have restricted access in the sense that you can just buy a pack of month, and within this pack, you have access to all the DLC which is available. And finally, they have in-app purchases for cosmetic items and so on. So you see, this is interesting because they started, you know, as like a, as a regular game with a, a traditional business models, you know, and they adapted it in a very smart way. A third example, and then I will stop here for those, it's Trackmania Turbo. This game is about, it's a game, with, uh, it's about racing, but actually the core of the game, it's not doing the race, it's building the racetracks. This game is built around a very, very powerful track editors. And actually, people are making the tracks. So uh, they have a huge community, and uh, you use the uh, track editor to build entire race tracks, and then you put them into the, the, uh, into the, uh, the portal of the game, and other people can play your race tracks. They have like, I think they have millions of race tracks made by other players on the game, very successful. And what do they sell? They sell DLC. What's in the DLC? The DLC contains essentially elements to build tracks. Because people buy the games, essentially, you know, to play the race, of course, but also to build the tracks. So they are selling the DLC to the people who actually are making the tracks, okay? If you want to have special shapes of curves and special bridges and special decoration items and so on, you can buy them through the DLC. So this is interesting because, of course, when you are playing the game, you download rest tracks made by other people. Uh, you don't pay anything, okay? But the one who are actually spending the DLC are the one who are actually making the tracks. And this is smart because DLC, on average, it's well, based on what, I, what, I've, what I've seen on other products, it's maybe at the maximum 25% of people will buy the DLC, which is not much. By focusing on the most active people in the community, you know, they, uh, they don't frustrate most of the players, but at the same time, you know, they cash on those who are actually, you know, the most active. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a pretty smart way of generating money with those who actually you know the, the, the power user of the application. So far, I've talked about games which are PC or uh, console. You know, uh, I will give another example. You know, of merging uh, strategies. It's uh, Boom Beach. Boom Beach. It's the third title published by um, uh, Supercell. And uh, so Supercell, obviously, it's a mega experts on in-app purchases on uh, uh, pure freemium recent strategy, and they introduce some subscription. This is very interesting. I've seen that uh, about a year ago. So in that game, obviously, you can buy resources. You can see that. But also, you can subscribe to get uh, somebody who's going to help you build things in the village anyway. So you see that in spite of the fact those guys are really dedicated, you know, they have an immense uh, 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 skill on the design of free-to-play games, you know, they are, you know, merging also the monetization strategy. And it works so well, they've done it on another game. They've done it on Hede, which is another game uh, about farming. So, what I'm pointing at now is that first we saw the various monetization strategy for a game, okay? Then we discover that for today's game, you know, the future is really about mixing those strategy, depending on your game. The question is that, okay, which one do I, do I select? How do I select? And this is where things are very difficult. And myself, as a designer, I was facing the problem. Remember, uh, um, I, as a freelance, you know, I do different kind of job. I do consulting, uh, I do full game design, but also, you know, I work on game concept. And one of the first things I do when I work on a game concept is that, obviously, I try to define a USP. This is something that will, you know, get my people attracted to the game. Uh, I'd very also, uh, I define the monetization strategy. This is one of the few questions I, I have to uh, address when I work on a concept. And the question is that, okay, I ask myself, okay, how do I define the best strategy for a game? It's not simple. So the method I use is that I ask myself four questions. 
And based on those four questions, you know, it helps me find the right monetization strategy. First question I ask myself is that, who am I targeting? Am I targeting hardcore gamers or casual gamers? And based on the answer, it helps me select which strategy are most adapted. So obviously, this is kind of roughly what is in my mind, okay? Uh, here, for the purpose of the masterclass, I'm showing it. Obviously, it's approximate, okay? But basically, it gives you an idea. So let's assume that, you know, your game can be the full 100% hardcore audience, or it can be completely casual. And here you've got all the monetization strategy that you can have, including premium, you know, which should not be discounted. And you, you see, depending on where your game is positioned, you know, some strategies are, ad are adapted, others are not. Clearly, subscription, you know, just will not work with casual gamers. It, work, it will work with hardcore gamers much better and so on. Episodic content, you know, this is more casual and mid-core and so on. Uh, advertising, you know, will not work with hardcore gamers and so on. So you see, this is something that helps me. And, the, and depending then, you know, on the, the game theme, uh, the platform and so on, then, you know, I can make my, my choices. So this is the first question I'm asking myself. Second question is that the platforms. Will I develop for game console PC or will I be more on Facebook mobile platforms? And here again, I'm using the same system. So I'm using this matrix and it helps me define. So this is a bit more easier here. The uh, platforms has less impact on the choice of the monetization strategy as, as other uh, uh, issue. But at least, you know, some strategy are, in my view, not adapted at all. The third question also, which is very important, has to do with the size of the game. How big will my game be? I mean, it's perfectly okay, uh, okay you know, to work on a small games. Actually, this is a strategy which is followed by certain studios. You know, they make many games that very small ones instead of one big one. So again, depending on the answer, some strategy are more or less adapted. For small games, you know, advertising is perfect, okay? Resource limitation can work and so on. Premium can always work and so on. But if you go for a big game, some strategy just don't work very well and so on. So obviously, this is my vision. Different people might have a different vision, okay? But this is the one I'm, I'm using personally when I work on game concept. And the last questions, I ask myself is, do I accept intrusive strategy for the monetization? This is important because, as I said earlier, some players and some studios don't like free-to-play monetization. You have to take that into account. You know, uh, especially in my situation, when I, I work with, uh, with studios, you know, I'm, uh, I'm a contractor, uh, I have to respect the will of my clients, and more importantly, I have to respect their values. And I know that some teams are highly reluctant to use freemium monetization techniques in the games. So again, depending uh, on the, uh, and then another, another case also what's gonna happen is that behind the studio, there can be a publisher. And the publisher, you know, might push for monetization. So depending, you see, on that situation, sometimes it's acceptable to have some intrusive mechanism in other cases, you know, you don't want to use them at all. So again, depending on the case, you know, whether I want my strategy to be intrusive or not, some of the monetization strategies work and others don't work. So you see here, what is interesting, and that's what I want to, uh, and I will conclude this part on monetization strategy, is that things actually are a bit more complex than it appears. Mm -hmm. The first thing I want, first advice I want to say is that don't necessarily copy what is already done. Maybe it's working in a certain context. Maybe it worked at a certain time. But for your games, you know, you really have to look hard at what makes your game unique of your audience, you know, and based on that, you have to make your own mix of monetization techniques. I also mentioned, you know, things which appear to be remote from pure freemium, you know, episodic content. DLC, subscription, you know. Obviously, this seems to be outside the talk of this masterclass, which is dedicated to freemium design. But to me, it's not. Because freemium is just one side of the coin. 
We should never remember that the ultimate purpose of a studio is to generate money with this product, with this game. So depending on what the audience, their own taste, the market and so on, you know, they might have you know, to be a bit more flexible in adapting uh, the monetization strategy. Furthermore, things change. One of the things which I explained uh, earlier on is that in my career I've been, I've been working on different things. First I started on, a, on console, then Facebook, then mobile, now I'm back on Steam, PC games, console and so on. What happens is that market change. And today, it is true, the market today on mobile is completely saturated. It is very difficult to sell, to generate money with the games on mobile with premium design. So this is why it is important to keep in mind that there are alternatives. Sometimes it's better to go for a niche product on a platforms which is maybe not as popular as other platforms and, you know, you know uh, to, to be there. So, of course, maybe you will, you, you're, uh, potentially you will reach less gamers, but most likely you will make more money because you have a niche strategy. So this is why it is important, you know, to do that. If you want to adapt your games to the market, you have, you know, to have in mind all the panels, all the strategy which are possible. So this is for the first strategy that you have to work on when you're a game designer. It is, you know, the monetization. The other big issue now has to do with retention. And that's another big part. Another big part. So, yes? So what did you mean by inclusive monetization? Aggressive. In other words, the player, you know, will feel the pressure, you know, of... Uh, yeah. uh, paying up immediately versus... Yes, or advertising. When you've got you know, ads that pop in front of you every 30 seconds, you know, this is intrusive. You know. I know a game which is like a, a kind of game you, know, you play uh, uh, in the public transport. You know, the game sessions are, are very, very short you know, because it, it's a bit like an like a endless runner. So you keep dying all the time. And they have ads after every death. You know, so it's every 30 seconds you see an ad. This is intrusive. I will do the chapter on... Uh, retention because this is super important. And then unfortunately, I won't have time to talk much about the shop and the items to sell. But you know, uh, it, what I'm doing now, I think it's much more important than the rest of this. So I will focus on that. So retention. Retention should be actually managed over three time horizons. Short, medium, and long term. Short term, this is you know, the first contact the players will have with the game. Super important, remember what I said earlier on. Most of the people who discover a game, you know, they ne never come back. We lose them forever. So in order you know, to succeed this part, we have to understand a little bit more what's happening in the head of the player. So first of all, what happens you know, when uh, the player will discover a game? We have to accept that there's some anxiety in it. And I think we all feel that when we discover a game, we don't know. There's some anxiety because we don't know if we like the game, we don't know if the game will be too difficult for us. We don't know if we'll understand the game and so on. So we do feel some anxiety and it's normal. The thing is that the game should be designed in such a way that over the time, this exciting level should fall as fast as possible. Then another curve, which is also as important, is what I call the entertainment value of the game. In other words, how quickly will your game generate excitement? Usually, when you start again for the first time, excitement is very low because the player doesn't know the rule, because most of the game system is not here yet, and so on. Uh, sometimes because you've got uh, some kind of a, a boring tutorial. So the result is that usually when somebody discovers the game at the first time, excitement is very low. However, obviously, the purpose of the game designers is to make sure that the curve goes up very quickly as possible. Keep this graph in mind. The objective of a game designer when he's working on short-term retention is to make sure that the excited curve falls as fast as possible and to make sure that the excitement curve goes up as fast as possible. And you'll understand, you will understand why uh, very soon. So for short-term, what are the objectives of the game designers? The first objective, obviously, is to create an enjoyable experience. Remember what I said earlier on when I told you, you know, the, uh, what is the player thinking, you know? 
We made a promise to the player. We attracted the player to a game by making a promise. You like medieval Japan? This is game is for you, and so on. This is very important. So we have, you know, to deliver this thing very, very quickly. Moreover, what is also, uh, sorry, I did not display the right thing. Moreover, you know, we know that because the game is free, if we don't have this, you know, this engagement mechanism provided by spending real money. So we know that, you know, if the player does not enjoy his first minutes, you know, he might just leave very quickly. So the result is that for the game designers, the first session, this is super important. I will not, I, I will never insist enough on that. If you work on a game as a game designer, game mechanics is important, but onboarding the first session is super important. It has to be crafted. In other words, you have to almost plan you have to anticipate everything that the player will discover when he starts a game for the first time and make sure that every 30, 40 seconds, he gets something exciting. So for that, you have almost, you know, to craft every single step and making sure that everything is exciting. And it can be anything like a screen, a menu design, a sound, you know, basically it's like somebody, you know, imagine that, uh, there's a door here, okay, and I'm the player, so there's a door, I open the door, you know, I, I see the room, I don't dare walk into the room yet, okay, but if there are things in this room which are interesting, maybe I'll open the door bigger, and I'll say, hmm, that's interesting, I like it, okay, and then I see other exciting things, maybe I will step in the room, that's exactly how onboarding should be designed. If you have the chance that the player discovers the game for the first time, you know, make sure that every things he, he does, he sees, he hears, and so on, are exciting. So after that, you know, once people are engaged in the game, it's okay, you know, but at least the first beginning should be super exciting. And then also the other objective of the game designer is that, okay, my players has enjoyed his first session, I want him to come back, you know, for another session. So that's, those are the two prime objectives of the game designers when working on short-term retention, which is for onboarding. So what are the best practices? I will kind of go a bit fast because I'm running out of time. So first of all, obviously, get the player into the game as, as, as fast as possible. Embed the tutorial into the game. A bad practice is to start the game with a long and boring tutorials. Don't do that. Remember, why is the game exciting in the first place? It's a gameplay. Huh? This is why we play game. Because we like the challenge, we are curious and so on. So give that to the player right away. Don't force him to go through, you know, boring menus and uh, uh, meaningless, meaningless menus and boring tutorials, you know. Get the player into the game as fast as possible. Obviously, don't ask also the player to register before he has even tried the game. This is, people don't like that. People don't like to give their Facebook accounts or their email or even their, their, their gamer tags, you know, if they don't know the game. So don't do that, you know. And obviously, uh, when there's a launch for the first time, skip unnecessary menus. Of course, all the games have a main menu, which is needed, okay. But for the first trial, the first time somebody plays the game, get the player directly into the heat of the game rather than, you know, going through, you know, the, the logical sessions and so on. Second recommendation, if possible, start your game with a short narrative, a short storytelling, you know. Again, this is what was done in Boom Beach. You know, it's kind of surprising because it's a combat game. It's a bit like Clash of Clans. So nobody cares about the story. Nevertheless, this starts the game with a short little narrative, you know, like you see the, basically your, your island is being attacked. You need to defend and you can see, you know, the, the bad guy, you know, who looks really evil and so on. So, why do they do that? You know, because we are all attracted by stories. This is like part of our, us as human beings. We love being told stories. So this is one way, you know, to attract people, especially if your game is a bit complex. If it takes time to explain the game, then, you know, to make the game, the tutoring less boring, if you put some, some storytelling, you know, not only you will attract people, but on top of that, you will make the tutoring appear less, less you know, less, less boring and so on. Another best practice, offer the player an experience as unusual as possible, you know. Smash Hit, for instance, you know, which is a fairly innovative game. This is a splash screen. Just by looking at that, you're attracted. 
because it looks like something you've never seen before. Uh, it looks mysterious, you know. So not only those guys are offering an interesting uh, game system, okay, but it looks so different. So clearly, you know, this is going to attract people. That's, that's what I mean. M make sure that, you know, your game will just stand out from the very first image. Show the player the scope of the game. What I mean by that is that if your game is uh, resting on progression tree, even if those are, those are small, show them to the player. Like in Boom Beach, when you start, again, you have your islands, you have to defend it, it's a bit like Clash of Clans. So first, you know, you only have one little tower, you know, but the game shows you all the equipment you can unlock. The machine guns, the, uh, the mortar, and the flame floor, and so on, so on. So of course, this is not accessible yet. It tells you, well, if you want to reach this one, you need to unlock such level and so on. But at least you get an idea of how big the game is. And you say, well, if the game is interested, you know, uh, yes, I know that if I play more, I'll be able to unlock all those exciting things. It's one way to tell the player, look, if you play my game, I guarantee that you'll have fun in weeks and months and so on. Obviously, don't frustrate the player uh, before he, uh, he has accomplished anything in the game. This is something that sounds like common sense, but I've seen it in too many games where the uh, frustration mechanism kicks in too early. And uh, obviously, you, what, when, when that happens, you realize, well, if I'm going to play the game, then this is just going to, to, to cost me money because I'm blocked very quickly. So don't do that. Uh, it's smarter to Obviously, you cannot allow the player to play as much as you want. You need somehow, you know, to stop him. Uh, a smart technique is what a uh, company like Supercell is doing. Like in Clash of Clans, for instance, when you um, attack another village, you cannot attack it, you cannot attack another one right away because you need to replenish your troops. So, you know, it's somehow, it's a natural way, you know, to, to slow down the player from playing too much and making sure he's going to return and so on. Very briefly, you know, I cover some points uh, on how you know to make this short-term retention. Again, I insist on the fact that this phase is super important. So uh, too often, I see t design teams who focus on the core gameplay, which makes sense because the core gameplay, this is what will get people into the game for month and month. Yes, but if you don't seduce them on the first day, they'll never come back anyway. So what happens on the first session is very, very important. And this is onboarding. And everything should be done here to make it exciting, interesting, and so on. Ideally, when the player has completed his first discovery of the game, you know, the first half an hour or first 10 minutes, whatever you know, he has to, to be excited to come back. When you succeed to do that, you won. Because the player, you know, will come back with he will, he will be eager to come back, to play again. If you succeed that, that means that you've done a good job on the onboarding. So short term, you see, it's just the first session, okay, very quickly. Then we've got medium term. This is the second time horizon for retention. Now here, the design object objective is different. The idea is that his objective is to get the player to return frequently to the game. In other words, we want to get the player to return on a regular basis to our game, every day, maybe several times during the day and so on. Now, to do that, we use a strategy which is called the open loop strategy. This is something that we've seen in many games. It's one of the key pillars in uh, retention for many free-to-play games. What's an open loop? An open loop is very simple. It's a combination of an objective and a reward. For instance, build free farms and you'll be able to unlock the bakery, okay? So in an open loop, you give an objective to the player and you, you give him the reward. So he knows what kind of reward he's going to get, okay? When he has completed the objective, he gets the reward, and then what happened? Immediately after, there's another open loop that kicks in. It's the same, an objective and a reward. The difference is that maybe this, this time, it takes a bit more time to complete it, okay? Once it's completed, what happens? Well, you get more open loops. Maybe this time you've got two of them to complete at the same time. So you need to choose, okay? 
and so on. Eventually, you get trees like that. You get trees with an endless succession of open loops. Now, this is something that you guys have seen hundreds of times. This is a very frequent strategy in many games. Why do we find it so often? Because it's very effective. Now, why is it effective? There are several reasons for that. The first one is that an open loop works on, again, uh, relies on human psychology. We human beings, when we st start a task, we want to complete it. It's within us. You know, it's, we don't like to have unfinished business. And this open loop strategy rests on that. Usually, when an open loop is printed to the player, it's already partly completed. In other words, the player already has some of the resources needed you know, to complete the loop. So it's unfinished business. He's going to complete the loop because you know, somehow you know, he wants the whole thing to be completely, to be clean and tidy and so on. So of course it's a bit vicious because as soon as he has completed one open loop, it's another one and so on, so it's endless. But you see why it is effective to get people uh, attracted, hooked. Another reason also, it's the way those open loops are made. We talked about open loop is a mix of reward and objective, okay? Now, what makes them unique and so effective is that first of all, the player understands that he can achieve the objective by grinding. In other words, by playing the game, he can, match, he can reach the objective. In other words, it will not rest on his skills it will rest just on how much time he'll play. Of course, if he's a skilled player, he will go much faster. But even if somebody who is not skilled will you know, manage you know, to grind through and reach, complete the objective. This is very important because too many games, in too many games, uh, people who are not very skilled go away. They try the game, they say, well, this is too hard for me, I, I give up. By using this system, it makes it possible you know, to attract a large number of people, even if the game is difficult. The best example for me is World of Tanks. World of Tanks, it's a very complex game. You die all the time in this game. You get shot at. It's a multiplayer, so that means you need to know the maps, you need to know the strategy, you need to know, you know the vehicles, and so on. So it requires a lot of skills, okay? Nevertheless, they have this grinding mechanism, they have those open loops. So anybody can say, okay, if I play, okay, my tank, my tank gets destroyed, but I earn resources, and then when I have enough, I can buy a more powerful tanks, which hopefully will make my life easier and so on. So you see open loops work here and make the game accessible to anybody. This is important. So that's why I think it's, those open loops are so successful because they make it, make it possible for any players, you know, to at least to start enjoying the game. The other reason open loops are very effective is the rewards. Rewards is something which is valuable to the player. It is not just points or money or whatever, you know. The rewards, usually, it's a game feature. Something that will make the player either more powerful or will make him, give him more choice and so on. So what I mean by that is that you reward the player with something which is highly valuable because it's going to change his way of playing. So open loops are something that we see everywhere. I mean, they are used in games as casual as a Criminal Case, which is a, a hidden object games on Facebook and mobile, Wall of Tanks, even Leagues of Legends, and Clash of Clans, obviously, they're using it a lot, you know. So open loops is something which is essentially used to get your players to return on a very frequent basis to the game. Then we've got, you know, long-term retention. Now here the objective of the long-term is just to fight boredom. Eventually, when the, when the player has reached a certain level, you know, he knows the game very well, he masters it, you know, and what happens when you master a game too much? What happens, you know, when you've been playing over and over the same stuff? You get bored or you're going to see something else. There's no more challenge and so on. So long-term retention is just to keep those players into the game. What are the strategy for that? Now, first of all, you know, for long-term strategy, long-term retention, first of all, you've got what I call events and missions. Now, I'll give you a few examples of those, uh, of those uh, events. 
First, I'll take the example of Hede, which is a game, again, it's a second day published by uh, Supercell. It's a farming day. It's a farming game. Now, the game, uh, when I played the game for the first time, it looked awfully like Farmville. Same kind of thing, you know. Um, you have a farm and you plant trees on the wheat and uh, you harvest and it looks there's almost no gameplay. Quite. It's very boring, okay? So, of course, it's kind of cute, but basically, you know, it's, it barely qualifies as a game. There's no challenge and so on. How did they manage to make the game so successful? The, wor the game works because, you know, they've got those events. You've, you've heard about live ops. You know, there's a talk, I think, tomorrow on the topic. Very interesting subject, you know. Live ops is something which is very important if you want, you know, to build long-term retention. L live ops are like temporary events. You know, things that will happen, you know, usually during one week or one weekend, or maybe sometime one day, you know. Uh, special operation that will obviously uh, bring special rewards, but at the same time also will drive the players to spend much more time, even if the gameplay is as repetitive as in Hede. So in Hede, for instance, you know, from time to time, there's a ship that goes to your, uh, your, uh, your farm, okay? And uh, you have 24 hours to complete orders. So the boat needs, uh, I don't know, uh, 20 apples and, uh, and uh, 15 pigs and uh, 20 eggs and so on, you know? So, so you need to do them. The thing is that in that game, things take time, like any farming game. So suddenly, you know, the game becomes very exciting because if you want to complete the order, and obviously if you complete, uh, if, you, if you succeed in giving to the boat what you need, there's a big reward attached to it, okay? So suddenly, you know, with the core gameplay, the core gameplay becomes very exciting because you've got a time-limited objective like that. Another example also, uh, again, it's in the World of Tanks. Um, obviously, the main thing in World of Tanks are tanks. Uh, they're all different. And sometimes, you know, it can take a lot of time to earn, to acquire enough resources to buy and unlock interesting tanks. So they offer one way to speed up the process is that it's possible to unlock certain high-level tanks by doing missions. So missions are of increasing difficulty. So the first one are, are easy. Later on, they're much more difficult. But if you complete all those missions, eventually, you know, you get a free tank, and usually it's a very nice one. So that's another way, you know, uh, to, um, to motivate players to play in the game. The difference between the two is that in this, this example, it's time limited. You've got 24 hours to fill up the orders made by the bot. In this one here, it's endless. In other words, you know, it takes time, but it's always there. So maybe you will take one week or one month or six months to complete the missions. But at least, you know, it's there. And then also you've got uh, limit time-rated tournaments. This is what they do in, uh, in Clash Royale, which is, I know, the fourth game published by Supercell. Now, the fifth one is coming uh, pretty soon. Uh, very, very successful game, and it's the same here also. They've got time-rated tournaments. So, for instance, you know, when they introduce a new card, you know, it's a, it's a uh, game training card. So, all the game rests on, on, the, on, the, on, on the cards, of course. You know, it's a main, main gameplay element. So getting a new one, it's super exciting. Usually they introduce a new card every, I don't know, every two months, something like that. So what they do is that when they introduce a new card, they have these time-limited tournaments. And if you win the tournaments, you can have the chance to earn these new cards before it is made available to all the players. So people love it. Because, you know, it's always fun, you know, to show that you have something unique. And uh, they have those limited tournaments. They last for only 24 hours. And if you win the tournament, which is essentially winning uh, a number of, of, uh, of, of duels, then you earn as a reward these cards that you people have. What, is, what makes them so effective, you know, is that it's time-limited uh, event and also the reward, which is always high. Remember, for those special events, for those missions to work like open loops, the reward has to be interesting. If it's just gold and, and XP, people don't care about it. But if the events, the missions, or the open loops reward something which is exceptional, something that will help people play in the game, then obviously it's, very, it's highly motivated. Another also feature which is very useful for long-term retention are clans. 
So clan is something which uh, has existed in the game industry for years and years, okay? This is something that we've been accustomed to in MMOs and so on. Clans used to be, I mean, clans are great. Clan used to be something which was very kind of uh, a bit uh, elitist. In other words, um, when you were playing MMO, if you decided to join a clan, it was kind of uh, almost like joining, you know, like a real group. Uh, it has, you had, you had your duties. Uh, you were expected to contribute. Otherwise, you would just be kicked out. Uh, so that made it exciting because being in a group is always exciting, but it was getting to the clan was difficult. Usually you had to be co-opted. In other words, other people in, in the clan had, you know, someone to recommend you and so on. So it was a very effective system, but it was a bit closed. You know, it was reserved for, uh, for the el elite of players. Now, what we've seen recently is that games which are not necessarily hardcore focused are also introducing, you know, uh, clans, but in a much, much uh, simpler way. And this has changed everything because it's bringing to large number of players, including casual players, all the fun associated with belonging to a clan. And this is what we're going to see now. So what is good about clans is that, as we know, they foster strong emotions. When you play alone, you play for yourself. When you belong to a clan, you not only play for you because you expect benefits, but you also play for the good of the clan. It's like in a family. It's like on a, on a wolf pack, okay? You act, you contribute to the clan because you contribute to something which is larger than yourself. And it fosters strong emotions because it fosters the emotions of cooperation. It fosters the emotions of, of altruism, helping others, okay? And also it fosters the, the emotions of usefulness. Those things are very, very important because for those of you, you know, many of you, I guess, practice multiplayer, and probably you've noticed that, yes, it's fun, obviously, when you're in multiplayer, you know, to eliminate an opponent, because, you know, you are basically, when you eliminate an opponent, you know, you're not eliminating a bot, it's a real player, so, you know, it's, a, uh, it's, it's more rewarding. Uh, so, pure competition is effective to generate emotion, but at the same time, when you help other players, when you contribute to something, bigger, you know, it generates much deeper emotions. And actually what we noticed in, in terms of game design, that cooperation emotions are usually uh, motivates players more than pure competition. So this is what clans are exactly best at. They just foster those uh, strong emotions associated with, with uh, uh, cooperation and so on. New clans, as the one we see in Clash of Clans, in Head and so on, they're accessible. It's very simple to join in. No need to be a high-level uh, player. No need to be, uh, be co-opted. Basically, you know, it's made much easier to join a clan. You just apply and you can easily get in. So the result is that we are making an effective feature accessible to nearly every player. That's it, okay. Then also, uh, clans have to also offer in-game benefits. Otherwise, you wouldn't join. Of course, yes, you could join because you want to play with your friends and so on. But if belonging to a clan bring you in-game benefits that will help you play better, that's even more effective. And that's what they do. Uh, in Clash of Clans, for instance, when you uh, belong to a clan, uh, other players will give you troops. Um, you can also contribute to uh, clan-wide events, which will generate uh, uh, large rewards and so on, you know. So clearly, belonging to a clan is very beneficial for the players. Of course, there's always a cost of belonging to a clan. So if you get troops from other players in Clash of Clans, you also need to contribute, true. But in general, it's done in such a way that actually uh, the cost is fairly light. It's not like you need to be present at a certain time, you know, to, to, to do, a, to, 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 to form up a group and no, it's not that complex. Usually, the, what those clans are uh, asking are just to contribute by giving resources or troops and things like that. So it's fairly light. And clans have exploded. Uh, I was very surprised to see that in Hede, you know, Hede, it's a farming game. It's, a, it's like Farmville, I mean, it's a normal gameplay. They added clans. 
and they built a lot of features around them, which means that clans can work even if you're targeting super casual audience. The problem with clans is that uh, in terms of design, design is pretty, pretty heavy. There are many things to design. Uh, your game has to support it. Some games don't support it. So remember what I said earlier on, when you work on a game, when you're at the concept stage, you, know, you have to anticipate all those things. In other words, you should not only focus on the core gameplay, you should also say, okay, you should also anticipate how you will answer short-term, long-term retention. In other words, from the concept, you should try to anticipate what you will need, you know, if you decide to have long-term retention. Will you have clans? Will you have, a, will you have a, a events and missions and so on? You know, you, try, you should try to plan it from early on. Another way, you know, to uh, another strategy for um, long-term retention are game updates. Game updates published every two or three months. Uh, what do we find there? Usually new content, sometimes improvements, uh, tuning, can be anything. Game updates, again, this is something which is very important for two reasons. First of all, by adding new content, you understand that you are going to retain your players. Obviously, when you introduce like a, a, new, a new soldier in Clash of Clans, or new tanks, and well, not all of tanks because I just ordered too many tanks, but Clash of Clans is a good example. When you introduce like a, a, a new defensive building, a new soldier, clearly, you know, even if you are a, a, a long time player, you want to try, you want to experiment. So this is very effective. What is also effective is that when the, com when the community realizes that you always try to improve the game. Clash of Clans especially has been very effective because Clash of Clans used to have a very, it, it's a, you know, the construction game, you have to construct your, your village, you know. It's very complex. So for many times, for, there, there, there was a time when they improved the, the, the game, the game interface. In other words, in every update, you had improvements of the game interface to make the game easier to play. So again, the community, they, they like that because it tells them, look, uh, we are always, we are listening to you and we try to make the game better and better. And then you've got also a tuning, game tuning. Games like that, I'm thinking here of games like Clash Royale, where you've got many different cards. Uh, of course, the game has, are heavily tested before they're released, but you need to know what can happen, especially if people can upgrade the decks over the time. So you need to tune the values of cards. And game like Clash of Clans, you know, every month, every two months, you know, they tune the cards, you know, they modify them, you know, to avoid Im imbalances. World of Tanks is also doing it. So again, it's one way to tell the, the, your players that, you know, we try to make the game as good as possible and we adapt it. Another reason why game updates is important is that if you're going to do a free-to-play games, my recommendation is to start small. Don't do the whole game at once. First, develop the, the smaller possible game, okay, and test it out. If it works, then build from that, okay, and add new features. And obviously, game updates, that's the way to do it. Because if you bring new features, new interesting ones every two or three months, then new players will just love it. They'll be hooked to the game, they'll tell their friends, and so on. So planning, again, uh, game updates is something, you know, which for those two reasons, not only to keep players happy, but also, you know, to um, uh, avoid putting too much money at the start of the game is something that you really should consider. So uh, that's just what I said. Okay. Then, another strategy, obviously, progression trees and open loops that we saw in the, in the previous situation. Clearly, you know, this is something that also is very effective in the long term. Obviously, it has to be well-tuned. This is kind of difficult to do because if you are, um, if it takes too much time to complete a loop, then people will be discouraged. So you have to find the right tuning here, but it does work. Uh, so progression tree, clearly, you know, this is, this is good for long-term retention because people have a lot of things, you know, they can invest, they can look forward, and open loops are also very effective because by definition, you know, they give to the player like a, a temporary uh, medium-term objective to, uh, to reach. Shop on currency. Uh, hmm. um, so I'll just go to the, because I, I guess you, you guys all know what 
soft and hard currency are. Uh, so I will pass on that. I will just go to my conclusion page for just what to sell, a few recommendations. It's probably the most useful page here. Now, first of all, in your shop, in the game, obviously you will sell different kind of items. Uh, some items can be, buy, can be bought with soft currency, hard currency, so just remember, soft currency is the currency that you earn by playing the game. Hard currency is a currency you buy with real money. So in the shop in your game, you can sell any kind of thing. And some items can be bought with soft currency, other with hard currency, and so on. So which are the most effective ones? The most effective items you can buy, you can sell, are the ones that will bring a new experience to the player. In other words, uh, in your shop, let's take the example of, I don't know, like a, a game like Clash of Clans. In your shop, you don't sell an upgrade, but you sell like an, an entire new item. For instance, like a, um, a new defensive building, a new tower. Now, now this is, you know, for the player, this is exciting. Why? Because, again, this has to do with gameplay. You all know how gameplay works. To have a good gameplay, you need to offer challenge, okay? But you need to offer choices. The more choices you offer to the player, the stronger your game will be. Because this is what game is all about. You are facing a challenge. This is the principle of core gameplay. Okay, you're facing a challenge. And then how do you meet this challenge? You, you make choices. You make, you make tactics. And the more options you've got, the better it's going to be. So this is why. If in the shop you offer new tactical choices, this is really what's going to get people more, more exciting about it. So those items are the ones that sell the best. Then also, Items can be either permanent or consumable, disposable, okay? Again, the consumable items are the most popular. In other words, items that don't last forever. This is why also some games are renting items, you know, like uh, some games, they rent weapons or vehicles and so on. You have them for a limited amount of time, but in, 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 uh, in any case, just go for those items rather, you know, that things which are permanent. You can also play on the level of scarcity of items. In general, everything that will make your uh, item appear uh, rare or difficult to get, you know, that will get them, give them a lot of value. This is why in some games, some items, you know, they appear and disappear, especially for cosmetic items. This is very effective. Sometimes an, uh, an article is, an item is available for just one week or one month. Or sometimes, you know, an article, an item has been there forever, and then it is told, oh, in one week, the article will be removed from the shop. The sales will explode. People want to buy them, you know, before it disappears. Because automatically, the fact that this item will not be available means this item will become rare and so on. So those things, you know, do, do work. You know. Another thing also which is very effective is quantity limited. In other words, you say, okay, I'm going to sell like this, uh, I have this, uh, this special, special sword, okay? but there are only uh, 100,000 available, S limited number. Again, this is going to drive people you know, to buy the item because they want to be sure to have it. So all those little tricks you know, help, makes, uh, help define you know, the kind of items you want to sell on how to sell them. Last thing, you know, and then I guess I'll, I'll go to my conclusion, is that uh, you have essentially, when you design the shop, you've got three strategies to design the shop. First strategy is you define a shop with you've got everything. So you've got hundreds of items in the shop. Can be anything, resources, cosmetic items, equipment, and so on. This is kind of good. The benefit of this system is that when the player starts the game, he goes to the shop and see all the things inside. He says, wow, this is incredible. This is, the, the game is so rich, it is good, you know. It's a little bit like showing the scope of the game. It's the same. The problem with this, with this uh, approach, with this strategy, is that it can be a bit frightening to the player who's not accustomed to it. Remember what I said earlier on. When people discover a game, you've got this anxiety level which is too, too high. You want to have it fall. When the player that discovers the game goes to the shop and see all the diversity, say, oh, this game is too complex, not for me. So it, it could scare away some people. This is why another strategy when you design the shop is the, uh, the reverse. The shop sells almost nothing. 
it only sells you know, basic resources. And then with the resources you know, that are sold in, uh, in hard currency, then you can buy you know, all the other, you can buy upgrades and things like that within the game. The benefit of this system, obviously, is that it makes the game, it makes the shop much more easy to understand. The problem, obviously, is that it removes a lot of uh, 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 depth to uh, offer different kind of uh, items. Because in a game, you don't necessarily know what players will want. Some players, you know, will spend money only in, uh, in items which have an impact on gameplay. Other people, they spend money on cosmetic items and so on. So you, you, you can never be sure of what will work. If your shop is very limited, then you don't, you, you, you know, you, you run the risk of selling items which will not please the players. And the third strategy, which is not used very often, but I just mentioned it also, is just to sell items directly in real money. Uh, one game has been very successful with it, it's Clash of Clans. Uh, no, no, it's a, a sorry, a Candy Crush saga. I mean, now they remove that, but uh, initially, when you were out of turns in this game, you know, they would have, there would be a pop-up and say, well, you, would you like to buy five turns? It's one euro. <laughs> so it's very aggressive, you know, when we talked about, you know, aggressive monetization, so this is very intrusive, but it did work. So that's another way, you know, no shop, but when somebody, when the player needs something, he can just buy it right away in uh, real currency. So, uh, I'm sorry, I don't really have much, much more time to spend on, uh, on the shop, although it's an interesting thing. But actually, the most in important things are retention and defining the right monetization strategy. Once you have, when you have defined those two points, the rest usually follows pretty naturally. So, my conclusion now. Uh, I guess most of you are maybe indie, studios or you want to create games and so on. Everything starts with a concept. You understand by now that two things, and I, I've, I'm sorry I will repeat it, but I know it's very important that when you work on a concept of the game, there are two things that you have to define very early on. You have to define, first of all, how you are going to communicate on the game. Marketing, marketing is very important you have to make sure that in your game concept, there's a strong USP, something that will attract people. And I think by now you understand, having said what I describe on the market, market is flooded, there are so many titles, premium title does not guarantee that people will stay and so on. So the thing is that if your game does not have something which will attract people and keep them early on, you're going to fail. And that means that you also have to integrate marketing. How will you communicate on the game? It's not enough to have a good game because now on the App Store and Google Play, there are hundreds of thousands of good games. And they fail, they don't work. Why? Because they did not communicate properly. Because they did not plan early on. So that means that when you're at the concept stage, you have absolutely to make sure that there's something in your game that will immediately attract player attention. It can be anything, it can be the theme, it can be the gameplay, it can be the graphics, it can be the storytelling, I mean, it doesn't matter. But there must be something early on. And you must make sure that this thing, this USP that makes your game unique, that will attract people, you know, you can communicate about it. In other words, you can use it as a support for your communication with the media, uh, we, we, uh, with the player and so on. So that means that when you are at the concept stage, you should not only focus on the game mechanism, but also you should focus on the overall game that will, be, that will attract people immediately. The second point, which is super important, you have to integrate at the concept stage the monetization strategy. It doesn't necessarily have to be freemium. As we saw, you can mix things. But an error to do, a mistake, is to do a game, and when the game is completed, they'll say, okay, we have got the game, how will we monetize it? It's too late. This thing has to be integrated from the very beginning. I think you understand now, especially after what we've seen on retention, that if you want to, if you want to succeed on a game, not only you should have a good game, but you should have a good game that will last for months, maybe year. So that means that your game system 
must be strong enough to support events, updates, uh, live ops, uh, upgrades, progression tree, and so on. This is what will make the success of your game. And this thing should be planned from the very beginning. So it's not only the strategy to monetize the game, it's also the strategy you know, to retain players. And the result is that when you are developing a concept, you are facing you know, all those issues, and you have to find answers at the same time. Obviously, you have to define the monetization model. Okay, You have to think of the communication strategy at the same time. You have to think of onboarding, level design, maybe some storytelling, I don't know, game mechanics, game animation. What I mean by game animation, this is you know, live ops events and so on, and even level design. And that's the difficulty. This is the challenge. So this is why what I recommend is that if you are going to do a game, you know, uh, try to be very focused. It's probably better to start on a smaller game. You know, maybe even if it's a niche game, it doesn't matter. Okay, uh, but be because trying, you know, to tackle all those issues at the same time is very complex. So start simple, okay, but make sure that your game has high production value. In other words. It doesn't matter you know, if your game will be uh, small in scope. If it's fun, if it works, you know, this is a very good start. And then you build from that. In other words, you start with a simple concept, publish it, get the result, and if it works, you build from that. You increase the size of the game. But of course, before that, you need to have plan the kind of feature. You need to have, uh, uh, can I say, anticipate your needs for retention and so on. But at least you know you will start with something small. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't matter. You, you, you use something else. But at least you know you have a global vision of what you want, and then you build from what you've got. So I was a little bit uh, short on the end, I'm sorry. So first of all, I want to thank you again for uh, attending my master class. Uh, this is you know the famous QR code. So everybody gets, uh, gets your, your smartphones and uh, pick it up on, uh, on, uh, on the telephone. Uh, I have a Twitter account, so I usually uh, I don't communicate very often. But when I see something interesting in the news, I use my Twitter account. And of course, you see my, my mail and my, uh, my website. Thank you very much again for your attention. Thanks to you.